Hi, good morning everyone. Um, so, like I told you earlier in the speech, uh, we have uh, the great pleasure of having a special guest today. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Mike Wagner from uh, NREL. So, uh, Mike Wagner is a uh, senior research engineer at NREL. He's been working there for, what, 10 years? 11, yeah, 10 yeah, or 11 yeah. years. And uh, you did your undergrad here. At Wisconsin. Yes. And then you moved to Colorado and then to Enroll. Yep. So I did my undergrad and master's here and then I moved to Colorado. So. Yeah. And so, like, Mike is really a specialist uh, into anything in computational power, uh, in modeling, and he's been working on that software that we were talking about, uh, Sam, that you said you downloaded and uh, started working on for your homework this week. So he's going to tell us everything about. All right. So it's, it's all yours. Yeah, thanks. It's recording. So. Okay. Um, all right, well, yeah, thanks uh, for having me. I'm uh, excited to be able to talk to you guys. Um, so I apologize in advance. My, I woke up with a sore throat this morning, of course, so my voice, hopefully it holds up. I'll try not to labor too much for you. Um, but, okay, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Wagner. I work at NREL. Um, so I want to talk about concentrating solar power and particularly – you know, it's a broad topic. So um, rather than going through all the fundamentals, which I understand you've already done some of that, um, I'll specifically focus on kind of what I work on, which is modeling and operations of this technology um, and kind of look at how some of the things that come out of uh, that practice can, uh, can be applied to other technologies as well. Um, all right, so before I get into the actual... Um, meat of the CSP stuff. I just wanted to give you guys a bit of a picture of NREL and kind of what, what our research looks like. Um, so NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, is uh, located in Golden, Colorado. There's a couple different campuses, but Golden is the main one, and you can see that in the background there with all the PV panels and everything. Um, it's about 2,300 people, and a bunch of those are early career researchers or postdocs or um, visiting scientists. Um, we have a lot of partnerships, so NREL as a national lab works with universities, we work with industry, so like we, I'm personally part of agreements with the University of Wisconsin and we have students in the room today who are uh, part of those agreements too. Um, so we work kind of broadly with, um, with a lot of different people and that's part of our role. Um, so NREL is a, we, we span anywhere from kind of basic science, which is answering fundamental questions about you know, how, do, how do molecules behave in these environments and how does energy behave, all the way up to technology applications. So taking uh, those learned principles and applying them to something that will actually work in the real world. Um, so we do that in all these different areas. We have you know, renewable power, solar, which is what I do, wind, water, geothermal, transportation, uh, energy efficiency, and energy systems integration. So actually what I'm talking about today is this solar aspect, but also the grid integration and a little bit of the hybrid systems is kind of where a lot of this comes into play. Um, so a little primer on where our energy markets stand today. Uh, so back when I graduated, which was a little before this, this is where the cost stood in terms of uh, the different sources of uh, electricity production. So when I was coming into the workforce, utility-scale solar was not competitive. Like if you wanted to build a, a large-scale PV plant, photovoltaic plant, or a concentrating solar plant, it was sort of laughable if you wanted to do that in a competitive environment. Today, if you want to build a plant, it's laughable to do that with conventional technology. Nobody is building coal. Nobody is building nuclear because they're too expensive. Instead, people are building wind, uh, solar, and com uh, gas combined cycle. Uh, and you can see that in terms of the level of deployment. So this shows uh, over the last decade how things have kind of scaled up in terms of where our energy is coming from. So you have um, other renewables at the bottom that's sort of stayed constant. Hydro, so this is like the Hoover Dam, the you know big uh, hydro projects where you can't really add uh, – 
new canyons and fill them with water that have already been done. So it's kind of constant. But all the new renewable generation is coming from wind and solar. And there's been huge growth, as you can see. Uh, and then this, of course, filters down into where the jobs are. So if any of you are planning on going into the energy side of um, mechanical engineering, uh, it's likely that you would be looking for a job in the renewable sector because that's where they are right now. So we hear a lot about coal jobs, or at least we did in the last election, uh, that you've got to save the coal jobs. Well, there really aren't that many coal jobs compared to, say, solar or wind. Um, those are the two dominant employers in uh, energy production right now. Uh, and you can kind of see some of the others. All right, so one question that we get at NREL, you know, in terms of like what we do or what NREL does uh, is we're doing research, right? So why can't research that we're doing be done by industry? Why can't it be done by universities? What is the niche for a national lab? Well, we kind of fill this gap between where if you're a university researcher, you know, classically you would think of a univers university researcher as doing something like asking really fundam fundamental questions or just seeking knowledge for the sake of having that knowledge. Whereas industry is all about turning around a profit on a thing that they've made right now, right? So we're kind of that gap between taking that basic knowledge and applying it and developing new technologies that thing, then can go to the commercial stage and be used. Um, so, you know, just looking at a quote, it's often too risky for the private sector to, to be on that bleeding edge of research where profits are years and years away. And if you're a, a, a stockholder or whatever, at some point you, you look at the quarterly returns and that's like what people care about, right? It has to be this quarter that it's returned. Uh, but NREL assumes that broader view takes on the early stage R&D. And we do that with a lot of government funding, taxpayer funding. So um, we're, you know, we, have a, we have an obligation to kind of be taking risks that other people wouldn't be doing. All right, so you already heard a little bit about me. You don't have to read through all this. but So I've been at NREL for 11 years. Um, my role at NREL has changed over time, but right now what I do is uh, I'm what's called a principal investigator. So I write proposals to get funding from government agencies. I get the funding, and then I manage teams of uh, people who actually do that, the research um, for those uh, proposals that we do win. Um, my contributions or kind of my like resume would include things like developing software, including Solar Pilot, SAM, which we'll talk about, um, some others, SolTrace. I'm a co-author on that. And then a lot of what we do is write papers. So um, whereas you might, if you're working in industry, be making a widget or a refrigerator or a bike or something, we make papers. So that's kind of what we, what we sell, so to speak. So I have 50 or so of those and a few patents and some software records. Um, if you're looking for specific information from me, this is where I'm sort of good is software development, programming, statistics and probabilistics, um, optics, simulation, et cetera. And then as we said, I did my master's and undergrad here uh, and sat in the ERB that whole time. And then I did my PhD at School of Mines, um, which was a combination of mechanical engineering, uh, thermal systems, and then operations research, which we'll talk just briefly about later. All right, so kind of what I wanted to get out of this, or what I want you to get out of this um, lecture today is five different things. So first, I just want to communicate kind of in a little bit more detail than I think you did before how CSP operates, or like what, what are the operating principles for concentrating solar power. Um, Two is be able to identify some of the advantages and, and challenges for this technology because it's not, you know, despite the fact that I've worked on this, I'm, you know, there, there are significant challenges with it. And, uh, and it's not something that is, um, you know, I'm gonna claim to be the solution for everything, right? Um, we wanna be able to more completely dis define these ideas of design and off design because this comes into modeling quite a bit. Um, It'd be nice if you could get you know, num to number four. I, you take all these classes. I remember sitting through all the thermal, all the heat transfer, fluids, calculus, all that stuff. I mean, and you sit there and you're like, where am I ever going to use this? You envision you, you will have to use it someday. But it's sort of hard to picture like where that all comes into play. Um, so 
one thing it would be nice to get out of this if you can is to kind of see how those different disciplines filter into something specific like developing this technology. Um, and then lastly, uh, become familiar with some of the common modeling tools and approaches uh, for, for renewables. All right, so this we'll talk about, uh, you know, go through the operating principles and then a few more things. Uh, so you can't read it, but operating principles, modeling for design, modeling for off-design, annual performance. We'll maybe briefly talk on, touch on some of the economic characterization, um, optimizing performance, and then I'd like to save some time specifically for questions if you have any, but if, as I'm going through this, you guys want to stop me and ask questions, that's totally fine too. Um, I don't like to just sit up here and talk forever, so I'm glad to have some interaction. All right, so we'll start with showing you some pretty pictures of existing concentrating solar. So it's big, it lives in the desert, um, and it in, can involve different per permutations. So this grainy picture shows uh, a power tower facility that's in Morocco, it's called Noor. Um, so there's three different plants, but this one is the, the power tower, and then there's two different parabolic trough plants. You can see kind of the heliostats, and they all surround the tower. Um, but so these projects are very expensive to build. Um, this is a power park in California. If you ever fly to LA, you'll probably fly over this. Uh, you can see it as you're flying over because it looks like um, the sun on the ground, kind of. Um, so there's three here, three towers. Um, and the, this uses steam, so it, it just directly heats steam and then runs a, a turbine with that. This one is uh, in Nevada. Uh, it's called Crescent Dunes. This one uses molten salt, which we'll talk about more. So the salt goes up the tower, and it's stored in these tanks, and you can use that stored salt whenever you want to generate electricity. Um, this one you would maybe see if you fly into San Francisco. All right, so you already know a little bit about concentrating solar. I'm going to focus today on uh, power towers um, or central receivers, sometimes they're called. Sometimes they're called. Uh, so power towers are... Uh, one of the permutations, and they rely on you know having the receiver up where the heliostats can see it. So the the system here is a collection of kind of semi quasi independent subsystems that all have different roles, right? So you have the concentrating element, which is the heliostat field. You have the thermal element, which is the receiver. You have uh, storage, which is essentially just big tanks. Um, and then you have a conventional power cycle, right? So this is pretty much, aside from some of the subtleties around the heat exchangers, the same technology that is in nuclear and coal and biomass, it's exactly the same. Um, it's just a steam ranking cycle. So you should all know about those from thermo. All right, so what I want to do now is just kind of walk through what typical operations might look like for CSP, um, so this is my kind of semi-hokey version of the previous diagram. But so if everything's running, uh, what you have is you know light bouncing off the the heliostats to the receiver, salt coming from the cold tank up the tower gets heated by the light, uh, comes back out, goes into the hot tank. Then you have a separate pump here that takes fluid. This is now at like. 1,050 degrees or so, about 560 Celsius. Pumps that through heat exchangers, so you're now generating steam over here. That steam goes through a turbine, goes into the cold sink, and it's pumped back around in a closed cycle. So that's when everything's operating, but you don't have to operate everything all the time, right? Um, what if we only wanted to collect solar energy and not generate electricity for some period of time? You can do that. So you just take that same fluid out of the cold tank, run it through the receiver, but instead of drawing out uh, salt from the hot tank, it just accumulates. So at some point, if you do this you know, indefinitely, you run out of uh, salt in the cold tank, and then you'd have to, of course, stop your solar operations or use that salt in some way. Um, on the other hand, you could do electricity production only. So this is kind of the most interesting thing about concentrating solar is that you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be daytime to be generating, right? Like if you're a PV plant, you generate when the sunlight's available. 
If you're a wind plant, you generate when the wind's available. If you're CSP, you can kind of game the system. You can collect when the sun's there, and then you can use it whenever there's demand for the electricity, and that's not always during the day. In fact, it's often not. It's often when people go home and turn on their TVs and run their air conditioners in the summer and stuff, which is usually at night. So uh, here you just sort of do the process. Uh, on this side, so you pull a hot salt out, run, generate steam, and then charge or you know discharge into the cold tank. So that's, that is essentially the key benefit of CSP is detaching or decoupling solar collection or thermal, thermal energy generation from electricity production. And that's uh, one of the key challenges now that we're seeing in terms of uh, grid operation. So if you go to California, you go to these different places where you're starting to see a lot of PV, a lot of wind in, in the grid, they're running into issues where during the day, it's really of no value for anybody to be generating electricity because there's so much of that is covered by wind and PV. But during the night, you have to be able to generate. So what do they do? They need flexible technology, whether that's CSP, uh, whether that's battery storage or grid storage somehow, uh, whether that's building a new natural gas plant that can dispatch when you want it to. You know, all those are, are options. All right. so. It's nice and tidy to think about this system when you've got just one thing happening. You know, you're, you're operating the solar field or not operating the, the cycle or vice versa. But one of the challenges of the technology is it's a lot of really big equipment. And if you're starting up that equipment, you can't just flip the switch and turn it on, right? You have to go through a procedure. You have to take stuff that's cold and that's made of metal and heat it up without cracking it or sort of ruining it uh, due to thermal stress. Um, so a lot of these things come into play either when you're doing startup or when you have some transient, like say a cloud comes over. So here's we'll see, this little animation puts a cloud there. So say you're operating and uh, you've got the salt going up, a cloud comes over, you lose your heat source. Well, now you've got molten salt. So molten salt is basically basically table salt, I mean, it's sort of a permutation of that. It melts at 250C, okay? That's pretty hot for a melting point. So it's easy for it to freeze. So if you lose your heat source and you're running salt up through the tower and it's radiating heat and convecting heat away, what's gonna happen to that salt, right? Eventually it'll freeze. So somehow you need to build into your system a way of heating the salt when it would other, otherwise freeze. So as it goes through, yes, it loses heat, but it doesn't get to its freezing point. Okay, so one of the solutions that we've come up with or others have come up with for CSP is to put in electrical resistive heating in the system for these times when you'd need, uh, when you'd need that. And so you're now drawing electricity from either your operating power cycle or from the grid, okay? So that comes back out. And then now you've got kind of cold salt coming out of the receiver, you don't want to ruin the, the exergy or the quality of your, your um, heat in the hot tank, so you divert it to the cold tank. So now you need to design a system that diverts fluid, fluid to the cold tank. You have a valve in there. You have something that does the diversion when you've got uh, that situation. So that adds some complexity. Um, another uh, kind of interesting Scenarios during startup, like I mentioned. So during startup, let's say you've been sitting there all night and it's kind of cold out, it's the winter, and all the piping that was really nice and hot is now cold. Uh, if you introduce hot salt into a cold pipe, it will freeze, right? So again, you need to anticipate that and build in a procedure that heats that salt as you either go up or come down the piping that you have a procedure that preheats the receiver using maybe a subset of the heliostats until it gets to the point where it's, everything's warm enough and ready to go for, um, for the salt to flow through it without freezing. So all of this is to say, like, if you are building the system, you need to anticipate these things. If you're modeling the system, you can't just say, well, there's sunlight, therefore I'm probably producing energy. No, you have to go through a procedure in order to get to that. So the models are not straightforward in being able to simply take an observation, a snapshot in time, and know what's happening. 
you need to know that point in time and you have to know the history. So this is part of um, the modeling procedures that we'll talk about. All right, so um, what are the implications of this? Well, if you are uh, operating and you are trying to start up, um, you should know as an engineer that thermal stress is worst when temperature gradients are highest. If you've got something really hot and something really cold and something in between that introduces thermal stress, right? So that happens when you're starting up or when these transient things uh, are occurring. Um, and we know, you know from mechanics of materials or whatever that c components commonly fail due to cyclical fatigue, due to creep, and due to corrosion. So cyclical fatigue, that is like if you're, you know, if you're running your solar system, you start it up every day, you shut it down. You start it up every day, you shut it down. That will eventually lead to failure. Like it's just a matter of time. So you have to design for that and you, and you can anticipate that and maybe build into the system fewer ramps or build in enough uh, storage, say that you're not turning your cyclone in off every day. Um, and just the last note is CSP is not a steady state technology. So it's not like PV where it just sits there. You got moving components and you have to deal with that. So just kind of to summary, summarize some of the advantages for CSP, at least operationally. Um, so we know now it has storage, right? So that's a huge advantage. Um, the system has inertia. So if you, if you have a really uh, fast cloud that moves across the field, say it takes a minute or two, actually the system can keep operating, operating through that just because of the thermal inertia associated with it. Like it, um, you know, there's internal energy involved and it takes a little while for that internal energy to, to change. Um, it uses the conventional power cycle, so there's advantages just in terms of like off-the-shelf technologies, and it's flexible in, in the way it operates. Um, some of the challenges are that, as you can see, I mean, it had many. There's many components. There's a lot of different ways for the system to be uh, controlled and for it to fail. And sometimes, like in the case of the turbine, let's say your turbine goes down, that's a single point of failure, right? So in that case, you uh, have to shut the, the whole plant down while you fix that thing. So um, unlike PV where a module goes out, yeah, you can keep going with all the other 999 modules that you have. CSP, it's kind of, there's these single, single process points. Um, thermal cycling, as I mentioned, and then salt management just because of the freezing and uh, vaporization points. All right, so I wanna talk now a little bit more about how you segment out a design process or a design model versus off design uh, versus operational model. And so this is something if you ever get into modeling energy systems or you, mo you model a system that has um, some component of performance over time, this is certainly something that you're all gonna need to um, understand and, and approach uh, formulating the models in a way that uh, that deals with these different aspects. All right, so first, um, what do I mean by design point? Um, you know, maybe it's, it's fairly clear, but uh, the definition that I've come up with, or you know, my best attempt at it, is that we have a set of system character characteristics that define a throughput or capacity, like think about um, you know, a volumetric flow rate, or power output, um, something al along those lines under certain nominal boundary conditions. So if we take um, a particular example, like let's look at a car. So if we have a car, how might you describe the engine of this car? You might say, well, it's got a certain horsepower, right? So the Model T, I looked it up, it's 22 horsepower, really powerful engine. Um, so what does this say about the design point? Is, is 22 horsepower a design point? Well, it's kind of part of it, right? It's a system characteristic. It's, a, it's something that we use to describe the system. How, at what point are we describing this? Well, it has 22 horsepower, not all the time. Like if you uh, are not revving the engine, it doesn't have any horsepower, right? It has that under these particular specific conditions. So this ambient temperature, this RPM, zero humidity, to, like you can go down the list. So that's our boundary conditions, or you know, that's kind of what, what we're saying. Under these controlled circumstances, we get this system characteristic. But 
none of these are things that we actually design. Like you don't go in and add a horse to make more horsepower, right? You're, you're not changing that in the design. You're going in and you're making more volume in the cylinder or you're adding cylinders. Like those are the design decisions you're making um, where these are characteristics and boundary conditions, right? So CSP is the same. We've got these just a few characteristics like, okay, so let's say we want to have a system that produces 100 megawatts. Okay, so that's our turbine gross power. Uh, that happens at a pressure ratio of 150 or something like that. An inlet temperature of 565C. So these are all like characteristics. But the actual design choices we're making are like how, how big are the blades in the turbine? How many stages does the turbine have? What's the shell thickness? What's the material type? Boundary conditions, steam properties, um, ambient temperature, all those things that are sort of external to the problem. Um, likewise, on the heliostat field, you might say, I want it to produce 500 megawatts thermal at 60% efficiency. That's not a design decision, that's a characteristic. So you have to then go in and say, how do I achieve that by varying number of heliostats, their locations, the type of mirror I'm using, uh, and under which external conditions? Like, when do I get 500? Is it when there's you know, clouds everywhere, or is it when it's perfect sunlight, the most you know, the sunniest day of the year? So those are all things that you have to consider when you're uh, going through this design model. All right, so just kind of playing around with this idea a little bit. If we're thinking in terms of design, and you say, you know, every, everything else equal, what would happen to, say, the receiver if I added heliostats but didn't change the receiver, didn't change the thermal storage or power cycle? So if I added more heliostats, what would that say about uh, the power that I'm producing for, uh, on the receiver throughout the year. Well, with a larger heliostat field, you might say, okay, now at uh, a particular level of solar irradiance, let's say like a, a good value is like 1,000, say 1,000 watts per meter squared. So at 1,000 watts per meter squared, if I add more heliostats, now I'm going to get more power on the receiver, right? I mean, that's, it's obvious. Uh, fewer heliostats is the, the, the inverse. Um, but what happens if I add a huge amount of heliostats? Like, say I triple my heliostat field size at 1,000. Now, I've probably got way more power than I can handle on the receiver at 1,000. But what if I'm operating at 300 all the time? Then, that's, then you kind of have just enough, right? So you have to combine the, uh, the boundary condition, which is DNI, or direct normal irradiance, the solar resource, with the characteristic that you're trying to achieve. All right, so you could say, well, I've got a larger heliostat field. What if I, at all things else equal, added more receivers? So now the receiver can handle all that extra power. So now I'm producing a lot more salt, but everything downstream is the same. So now you might say, well, I'm going to really quickly fill up my salt tank. And uh, you'd have to start dumping energy from your, your field because you're, you're full in your tank. You can't use it elsewhere. So that's... Um, part of the design process of choosing the, the reference DNI condition, the reference solar irradiance condition. Now the last thing to think about is, okay, what if I did all that and I added more storage capacity? Okay, now you could fill up at the same rate. I mean, you have a lot more thermal energy here, but you'd have to operate your power cycle more um, frequently through the year in order to use that salt, to use that, all that, that energy. So that idea is called the solar multiple, right? Okay, so solar multiple tells you how much energy you have generated versus how much you can consume at any point in time. And that's a key design characteristic for this system is solar multiple and, and storage size. All right, so that's a, some of the, uh, the ideas around design sizing. Um, on the cycle, you could also do the same thing, like let's look at the condenser over here. So this is actually a fairly expensive piece of equipment. The condenser. If you look at it, if like you look at a power plant and you see a big building, it's typically the condenser. So some people might want to buy fewer bays in the conden condenser, fewer fans. What would happen to the system if you did that? Well, at higher ambient temperatures, you would have a higher temperature of steam coming out of the turbine, lower efficiency. So there's all these different trade-offs that you might have in terms of cost and um, being able to uh, get good performance out of the system.
All right, so um, here's kind of the approach that I take or that we, we take when we are doing a design point model. So first, we take our system and draw a control volume around the thing that we care about, right? So in this case, we'll just look at one heat exchanger. Um, so looking at that particular superheater, you'd say, all right, I've got boundary conditions, characteristics, and design decisions, and you just label those, all right? So now we've got um, mass flows of salt, temperature of salt coming in, uh, mass flow quality pressure of steam coming into the superheater. We'd say under, under the design condition, we know we want the steam coming out at, say, 550 degrees C, because that's what our turbine is designed for. So that becomes a boundary condition. We know we want an effectiveness in the heat exchanger of maybe 85 or 90 percent. Where does that leave us? So we don't know the physical size of the system, the UA. That's uh, heat uh, conductance times area. So basically, how big are we going to make this thing? And we don't know what the temperature is coming out here. All right. So like if you've done a heat exchanger model in, in heat transfer, you have done this, right? But the key is, OK, we choose certain things about the boundary conditions that we know, that we want to have uh, as part of the design pr process. And then we calculate things like physical sizes. Um, to do this, we need to formulate a model that relates all these items. So we'll go to ease, and we'll plug in our boundary conditions, and we'll call the uh, heat exchanger model using the NTU effectiveness approach. And we'll get back, um, we'll get back our conductance and, our, and be able to calculate a physical area so the goal is, how much metal do I have to buy to get all this stuff to happen? And, and this is kind of the answer down here. So that's our design problem. Uh, yeah. OK. So here's another design problem. It's a little bit more complex than a heat exchanger. So this is some software that I wrote called Solar Pilot. And what this software does is you go through and you specify all these conditions, and it comes back and calculates a uh, heliostat field layout. So like the position of all the heliostats in the field meeting the design point condition. So uh, you say, I want 600 megawatts coming out of this field. When? When do I want that? I want it when there's 950 watts per meter squared of sunlight on the summer solstice under these geometric conditions. And then you run the software and you come back with uh, a layout that achieves that. OK, so that's. You can see kind of the extremes. You can write a simple ease model, or you may spend years developing a design point model that does essentially the same thing. All right, so then looking uh, more at off design. Um, so we know the design is uh, the d definition we gave. Well, what do we mean by off design? So it's just if you start encountering conditions that are different from the boundary conditions you assumed at the design point, right? Now you've got. Um, you know, say you design for a particular ambient temperature. Now it's cold outside. Well, you're off design then. OK, it's fairly straightforward. So what are some examples of off design for CSP? Well, you could be operating at reduced turbine power. You could be operating at solar radiance lower than design, excessive wind speed or cold ambient temperature. Um, it could be that you have a piece of equipment that's failed. And now your mass flow rate that you were expecting to get is different. And, sort of downstream of that. All right, so going back to our heat exchanger model, how do you um, mo modify that to make it an off-design model? It's still the same relationships. Like, you still have effectiveness NTU, say, that you're using to calculate in a counterfull heat exchanger. But it's you're solving for different things, right? So now instead of UA and T, we know the UA because we already solved for that. And we know the coming out, um, now we're solving for what's our effectiveness. So as I say, I vary the mass flow rate or pressure or whatever. Now we're solving for uh, different variables. So it's kind of, I mean, the point is the, mo the model's the same. The relationships are the same. But we have to choose which things we're specifying um, under these design and off-design models. All right, so taking this kind of a step back, looking at an entire system off design. So we did this for the heat exchanger. Now what we want to do for the, the whole system, how do we take the entire system off design? What does that even mean? Um, so first we draw our control volume, and then we see what's coming in and out, right? So uh, well, those would be solar irradiance, as I said. 
um, ambient temperature, wind speed, pressure. Those are all things outside the system. What about market signals? What if you are working with a utility and they say, okay, I don't need your power right now, I need it later. That's a boundary condition. That's something that's telling you um, how to operate your plant. Oops. Uh, grid limits. What if you are constrained to only deliver 100 megawatts? Okay. So what we have to do in order to accommodate these off-design conditions is look at how the boundary conditions might vary over time. So essentially when we go through a design process, it's not enough to just pick arbitrarily, I want 950 watts per meter squared, I want 1,000 megawatts, whatever. You can't just pick it arbitrarily, you have to do it in the context of the way the system's gonna operate. So go through this and try to find 950 in the DNI column. Like you're not gonna find it maybe more than a couple times a year. So how do you actually, you know, what does it mean to actually be designing a system at that point? Um, really what we should be doing is designing for the off-design conditions that we're going to encounter. So if we look at a radiance, which has the most significant factor for, for CSP, um, like I said, you can see it varying. That's a, a one day in January 1st. Uh, if you take that entire year's worth of DNI readings and plot that on a histogram, you can see, okay, this is showing like for the, each of these bins, the percentage of time that the DNI would fall in this category throughout the year. So our design point was 950 up here. So yeah, that happens quite a bit, but not as much accumulated as what is happening um, in the other parts of the DNI spectrum. So you know, how, how do we go about designing for that? Uh, if we choose a design point value that's too low, then we add too many heliostats into the field. We won't use them all the time because you're often exceeding the DNI point. If you choose a value that's too high, then you've got too much receiver. You know, you don't have enough heliostats to, to get power to the receiver. All right, so what we want to do when we're designing is evaluate annual performance using an annual performance model at different design values and then compare the total economic benefit of each instance of the, of the uh, system at that different design value. So what that means is like, okay, I would choose as a starting point 950, right? And then I would run an annual model, see how much production I get out, look at the economics. Then I'd come back and try 900, 850, 800. Which of those gives me the best economic characteristic for my, for my system? And then I would go back and pick the one that did, and that's my that, that would determine sort of how many Healy stats, how many receivers, all that. All right, so that moves us into the annual performance and electricity production part. Um, so again, you know, we've got kind of these three different categories. We've got design, wherein we specify system characteristics, calculate component physical sizes, and then evaluate the dimensional parameters that are needed for the non-dimensional correlations. We have off design, where we have fixed physical dimensions. We're no longer solving for that, those are fixed. And then we have to describe a functional relationship between the boundary conditions and performance in the off design condition. So we need a model that says, okay, with a varying ambient temperature, this is uh, how the performance of the turbine might change. You have to have a model that says that. Um, and then we want to account for interaction among components and subsystems. And the last piece that we haven't really controlled, uh, talked about is the control part. So if you've got a system, it's not enough to say, okay, here's how I designed it, here's how it operates off design. You have to say, here's how it should operate under certain conditions. You have to say, here's when it should start up. Here's the process it needs to go to start up. Here's when it should shut down. Here's when I should use stored energy or not. Here's when I should switch a valve. So those are, um, those are control decisions and that also comes into play when we're talking about an annual production model. So the complexity of that control piece, of course, depends a lot on the technology. So like you look at PV, you can imagine the control aspects of PV are quite a bit different than the control aspects of CSP, right? You hear you've got just, it's generating electricity, it converts it, it goes to the grid. What, what do you control there? Maybe you clip it a little bit, or uh, you, know, you can maybe change the angle of the tracker, uh, whereas for CSP, we've talked about a lot of the different issues there. 
Um, all right, so just to illustrate the relationship between the performance of a system, the off-design performance, and the control, we can look at three different technologies. Um, so first we have a wind farm, and then a PV, and then CSP. So on the left we'll show typical production. Um, so this is like a few days in February, and this is showing the system power for a wind farm. Okay, so it's varying, it goes up and down, sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's basically the, the maximum level. What happens if we take that and plot the production against the uh, primary variable, which is wind speed or wind velocity? Well, it l looks a lot like this on an annual basis. So you can pretty much boil down the entire performance of a wind plant at any given time as a function of wind velocity. Right? That's kind of what it looks like. PV, pretty much the same thing. You can take that and you can boil it down in terms of plane of array irradiance, so like how much light is hitting the surface of a tracker wherever, or the PV panel wherever it is. And it looks kind of like that. Now there's a little bit more scatter, but basically you get the idea, right? CSP, now because of energy storage and the flexibility that comes in operationally, it looks not at all like anything useful, right? Like DNI is the most important thing for concentrating solar power, yet it is not a predictor of power output. You have to have the control aspect in there. All right. So let's see. I'm running a little bit behind on time, so I'll just skip ahead a little bit. So what I want to do is kind of walk through really quickly how you might do this modeling process in uh, Sam. So I think you guys are going to go over this uh, on Monday, but. Yeah, we're going to do it on Monday. Okay. <laughs> so, spoiler. Okay, so this is a very quick, you know, it just gives you an impression of the process involved, and we won't go through the details then. Um, so, what you want to do first is you have to decide where am I going to model this plant? Where do I want this plant to be located? Well, you can go to like, N NREL has these great tools like our N National Solar Resource Database. Uh, you can pick a particular point in North America and some in South America and download the data and then you plug that in in your location and resource. Then you come to specify the system characteristics. So like here now, again, we're talking about, okay, I have to say what the design point DNI, solar multiple, uh, temperature set points, how much storage do I have? Like these are the high level characteristics that you're trying to achieve. SAM, what, like what SAM does, system advisor model, is it takes those high level inputs and it solves a design model to actually physically size the components that are involved. All right, uh, next we would specify cost parameters because this is a techno-economic model. We have to know something about the cost, so like you'd say, yeah, if I buy a meter squared of receiver, that is gonna cost me a certain amount of money. Um, and you can do that across the board. There are certain parts of the model that you have to solve the design model independently. So you'd say, instead of like these automatically calculated values down here, which are part of the design model, you'd actually have to physically say, okay, here, I want go ahead and calculate a new heliostat field for me. That's part of the design model. Um, and you can optimize that as well. Uh, you might want to specify something about how the system's controlled. So you'd say, well, I want to look at operating uh, with these, this time window, uh, you know, June to September during the middle of the day is my highest uh, price time, and so I want to target that time. You might say something about those operations. Uh, and then you have to say something about who's lending you money to build this plant, right? It's like your mortgage. Like you gotta, you got to go in and say, like, how much interest am I going to get? What's my rate of return and everything? And then you solve the model, which is down here. Solve the model, and you get back a bunch of stuff. So this kind of gives you a, a sense of what's going on behind the scenes when you solve this model. You're calculating, you know, ultimately you want to get total power to the grid. To do that, you have to calculate solar angles, you have to do, you know, state of charge with thermal storage, temperatures, losses, you know, I mean, this is just a subset of the whole list. There's, there's like hundreds of, hundreds of things you're calculating and the amount of code that it takes to do this is, is quite expansive. So, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to ultimately get you to this 
single metric that you might care about. All right, so um, talk a little bit about, well, we can skip through this stuff. Um, so maybe one thing that's one thing that you should be aware of is the kind of the easiest way that we characterize the value of a system is to say um, how much does it cost to produce a unit of energy for this technology? So you could hear that levelized cost of energy or LCOE. So the simplest way is to take what's the total project cost, divide that by how much you might produce on a year in a year. Well, it turns out that's not quite enough. You have to do a little bit more uh, in terms of sophistication to get a full value. But that's one way that we assess which technology is best. Uh, PPA price is another. Um, but I think you know, with that, that kind of gets through a lot of what I wanted to talk about. I can take any questions right now if we have any. Yeah. So there's a couple things. That's a very good question. Um, so a couple things. One is the salt itself. So the salt starts to decompose at like 620 C or something like that. Uh, and then you start getting a lot of corrosion. So the particular salt that we use now um, is limited by that. There are other salts. But they're, you, know, you get, the, get this window of operating for salt. So like right now it's 250 to 600 or so. You can choose a different salt. Maybe it's 450 to 800. But now your salt freezes at 450, and like that's a big problem. So there's a lot of research going on right now in terms of the salt side of things. Um, the materials themselves start to really weaken above like 650 C. So like even alloys like uh, that include a lot of nickel and cobalt, like these really expensive ones, they can only go so high. So there's a kind of a cascade of things that become weak links at high temperature. Yeah. I have uh, two questions. One is concentrated solar uh, competitive price to solar electric because the graph you showed was just kind of like solar in general. Yeah. Um, are they close? Are they the same? So, uh, no, actually. Um, PV is like right now the bids for PV are coming in at like four cents mm -hmm. for levelized cost. And CSP is around like nine or ten or so, um, which is still fairly competitive, but it's you know it's it's not on the same level. the The advantage though is you know at some point uh, nobody's going to want more PV if the grid is saturated with PV. You don't need more energy during the middle of the day. You need it at night, and people are willing to pay more morning and night because you know the technologies that do that are more expensive. So where CSP is trying to fit in is we're not trying to compete with wind or PV. We're trying to compete with the more expensive ones that produce non-daytime. Yeah, that was my next question is because like CSP is such a low percentage of the energy that the grid uses overall mm -hmm. um, compared to other technologies. So like I was going to ask what is the benefit to CSP? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, like, what I was hoping to get to, and I didn't, was some of the operational stuff around. Um, let's see, maybe I can find it quick. Um, yeah, so they call it the duck curve because it looks like a duck. There it is. So the the duck curve is this is California's problem. So like, this is a typical day in March, I think, or this is an actual day in March. Um, and they looked at, OK, now we've added a bunch of PV. So this is the net load. This is like total demand for California minus production from like residential or whatever PV. So as you add more and more PV, eventually this starts to dip down. And you get to the point where like you just can't accept it anymore. You can't accept any more PV without having to start turning off your nuclear plants or whatever, or just turning off your PV plants. So yeah, I mean, eventually 
we need to have technologies that fill in just here and just here uh, because PV is really dominating in that particular market. So the angle for CSP is like, let's be at least cost competitive with the other technologies that can do that, uh, that can operate at the, that time. Yeah. So that's like, that's like the big theme of where all this research that I'm doing is actually going. So good question. All right. So it, it doesn't t turn out to matter too much. So can you, can you uh, say how you charge for a PV farm? Yeah, so if you have, like, so as, as long as your net load is being affected by PV, then it doesn't matter if it's residential or utility. But yeah, if you have battery storage, then there's very little value for CSP. The problem with batteries is that they're really expensive. Yeah. Much, much more expensive so than CSP. Yeah, or PV with longer term storage, like say four to six hours of storage. A lot of people do PV with like short term, like a half an hour of storage or something, just to ride through it. And Those storage that gives you electricity. Yeah, right. Storage that gives you something that fills in the bigger gap, right? And that is too expensive right now for batteries. So, okay. yeah, if if somebody can come up with a really cheap battery, then all this is <laughs> throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> So there are, there are um, some really good analyses that have been done on that specific question. So like people will take full grid models, like they'll model every single generator, you know, every little plant, and, not, and say, let's start adding in more and more and more and more PV, and like how does the grid actually behave? And so NROD does that, some of that stuff. So they've done those studies out to like, I think 2050, up to 80% total renewables. Um, in some of those cases, if costs for CSP come down and batteries don't come down, then yes, it is a big part. It's not like as much as PV or wind even, but it is big enough to kind of accommodate some of the dispatchability stuff. If costs don't come down, it's at least in the US, they don't see a lot of value, but like CSP is being built in China, it's being built in a lot of different places um, because in those markets, it is valued already. So just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. What was that percentage? Oh, that was the efficiency, optical efficiency of each individual helios. Okay. That, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, um, I should say um, my email is up here somewhere. This is my email. Feel free to shoot me an email. Like totally, that's fine. Um, I do spend time on campus. I have a fellowship here, so. Um, I'm on campus Mondays, and I sit up in Sandy Klein's old office in the 13th floor of VRB. So you're welcome to stop by on Mondays, too. So, All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.